It's past midnight on Labor Day 1979, and I am naked in my mother's backyard with a Catholic man. <laughs> he is so good and so Catholic that the next day he will leave for his new job teaching at a church school in Montreal, only a few hours north of my mother's home in New Hampshire. My mom likes this guy. She's liked him ever since I introduced them a few months earlier, shortly after we started dating. He is polite, respectful, and best of all, from her point of view, he's from a big Irish Catholic family like the one she's from. He knows how to navigate a large, chaotic tribe. This is important on any weekend in my mother's home, but particularly this one. More than 20 people are packed into her small house for the annual party we'll have at the nearby Lancaster Fair, the largest in the county. Actually, most of the Catholics in our crowd have fallen pretty far away from the church. The group includes my entire blended family, mother, stepfather, son, four siblings, and six step-siblings, one of whom is my ex-husband and the father of my son. <laughs> That's right, after her very un-Catholic divorce, my mom married my ex's dad. <laughs> Accor according to my mother, all this means as I am a sinner in a family of sinners. The idea of her son lying naked with me in a single sleeping bag would have given her nightmares, which could be why I'm about to do just that. <laughs> Another reason, there's not a single private space remaining in the house. His cot is in the basement with five or six other guys. Mine is upstairs in my mother's office. Bodies occupy all the beds, sofas, and floor space in between. The overriding reason, though, is that we are both 23, very horny, and I am just tipsy enough and needy enough to let go of what had happened a few weeks earlier. We'd been dating for several months when Catholic man invited me to meet his parents who'd come for a visit, a signal of serious intent. My feelings were mixed. On the one hand, he was my age, good looking, and great with my four-year-old. We worked at the same Massachusetts newspaper and he'd throw me the best birthday party I'd ever had. On the other hand, he was the first person I'd ever met who believed utterly in the infallibility of the Pope. He still dressed like a Catholic schoolboy, navy polyester pants, a polo shirt, usually with horizontal stripes, which made me cringe. Uh, I don't remember seeing him in a pair of jeans or without his Yankees hat. That hat was his signature piece of clothing his rebel yell in a state full of Red Sox fans. He wore the hat the afternoon he uninvited me to dinner. When he'd told his parents I was divorced and had a four-year-old son, his mother had wept. She'd packed her bags. She'd made it clear that he could eat with her or me that weekend, but not both of us. He chose her. Now, I was the good kid in my family, the boring one, who after surprising everyone by getting pregnant my freshman year in college, graduated in three years, got a job, made everybody proud. But I still wasn't good enough for her baby, who hadn't uttered a single word in my defense. I told myself this was no big deal, that it was her loss. But the truth was shame and anger smoldered inside me. I suspected that Catholic man was attracted to me, at least in part, for the same reasons his mother rejected me. I was no virgin. He didn't have to treat me the way he probably treated the good Catholic schoolgirls his mother would have welcomed. Worse, I half believed this made a terrible kind of sense. But I really didn't know what to do with these thoughts. So I stuffed them down and acted like everything was fine. He'd be leaving at the end of the summer for that job in Montreal anyway. Until then, I wouldn't tell anyone and just rise above the insult. I did this so successfully that sometime between that awful day and Labor Day weekend, I found myself saying yes when a Catholic man asked if he could stop by my parents' house on the way to his next life. He arrived at the home of my mother and stepfather full of his usual good boy charm. He'd barely parked his car before he greeted them respectfully and began carrying coolers back and forth from the house to the car. He told jokes with the siblings, stood ready to lend a hand when a hand was needed, and stayed the hell out of the way when one wasn't. I saw how much he enjoyed his effect on my mother. 
He practically preened when he overheard her say to me, he's so nice. Now I saw him through her eyes and I felt nicer by association. And the more my mother smiled, the nicer I felt. My anger and confusion regarding Catholic man ebbed. This led to a happy day at the fair full of fried chicken, beer, music, dancing, and rides. And around 11.30 that night, Catholic man and I arrived back at my parents' house. An hour later, he and I are hauling a sleeping bag out to the backyard. Now, yard isn't accurate. The land behind my parents' home is a field that runs halfway up the side of a small mountain. It is surrounded by deep woods. Normally, I would have killed a proposal to spend any part of the night out there. I'm afraid of the dark, for one thing, and wild animals for another. <laughs> on, on the other hand, I no longer take sex for granted. I, I love my kid and my job, but they don't leave much room for spontaneity or sex, or just to act my age. So I say yes. We wait till all the others go off to bed. He smuggles a sleeping bag from one of the cots in the cellar, and we head up the hill. The grass is as high as our hips. The stalks of dried flowers scratch my ankles and knees, but nothing can scratch through his polyester pants, so he goes a little ahead. <laughs> yeah. He stops halfway up the hill within a flattish place, and with a flourish unfurls the sleeping bag. The zipper makes it one third of the way down, then sticks. It's okay, we can squeeze in, says Catholic man. So we strip, we shiver in the cool autumn air. We drop his hat and my glasses on top of our clothes and somehow manage to wedge our way into the sleeping bag, which feels like a giant tube sock that has lost its stretch. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's actually okay, it's, it's almost good. <laughs> the moon is overhead. A breeze whispers in the trees at the edge of the field. The brook that runs nearby chuckles softly. We are skin to skin, warmer now. We kiss. Then we hear a sniff. A sniff that communicates curiosity, interest, a degree of suspicion, a whole body kind of sniff, a body that from the sound of the exhale is huge. Are there bears, says Catholic man? His embrace is turned into a vice grip. I try to reassure us both by hissing, they're probably more afraid of us than we are of them. <laughs> and he says, but bears are a lot bigger, he hisses back. The silence stretches from seconds to what feels like minutes. Whatever it was seems to be gone. Our bodies begin to relax. We kiss again, but nearly bite each other's lips off when we hear a rustle. We tense up, more rustling. We can't tell if it's moving closer or further away. Then, whatever is out there inhales again. <laughs> closer, much closer. One more and we run for it, he whispers into my ear. Then comes a sniff that sounds more like a snort, followed by the sound that large legs make when they are moving with purpose through the brush. We thrash our way out of the sleeping bag. We run. I trip and fall flat on my face, but he drags me up. We don't stop running until we are standing inside my mother's house, naked. <laughs> I've lost my glasses somewhere in the field, but I squint at him through the gloom. He somehow had the presence of mind to grab his goddamned Yankees hat. <laughs> Uh, our dilemma dawns slowly. Behind us are our clothes, my glasses, and what we are both convinced is a bear. Ahead of us, the gauntlet of sleeping bodies that lie between us and our beds. We look around, and I silently applaud my mother's decision to build an entire mudroom for coats and boots. I yank a parka off a hanger and hand it to him. When he puts it on, it covers everything down to his belly button. He, he grabs another jacket and wraps it around his waist. I find a rain slicker that more or less covers the essential bits. We tiptoe into the kitchen, 
pause and listen. Nothing except a few snores. We inch forward in the dark, picking our way into the living room where bodies lie like corpses at our feet. One door leads to the cellar steps, the other upstairs to my room. We bid each other a silent good night. I climb the steps carefully so as not to make them creak. I nudge open the door of my mother's office, turn, and close it behind me. I've made it. I take off the raincoat. When I turn toward the bed, my mother's voice finds me in the dark. <laughs> Betsy? She's wide awake in the second twin bed. There is no reason for her to be there except for maternal radar. <laughs> yeah. She flicks on the light, leans up on well, one elbow, takes in my nude body. She's got that resigned, seen it all look. <laughs> you want to tell me now or later? <laughs> so I tell her about the bear. She laughs. It was probably just a deer or a raccoon. More likely his mother, I mutter. <laughs> then I tell her what happened a few weeks earlier. She sighs. Well, you can't blame her. That's the way we all grew up. She offers no sympathy, but there's a touch of iron in her tone, and I know that it is not directed at me. The next morning, my mom rises before me. By the time I dress and get downstairs, there's a small crowd around the breakfast table, and everyone has heard about the bear. <laughs> Catholic man sits among them. He's wearing my stepfather's plaid bathrobe and his Yankees hat. <laughs> he grins like a good sport. Still, he blushes deeper every time someone new walks into the cushion, kitchen and says, so, <laughs> I hear there was a bear. <laughs> my son, who's been treated to a sanitized account, asks me what the bear looked like. But my brother, an early riser, has done some reconnoitering and walks in just then. A bear, he says, and rolls his eyes. From the bundle in his arms, he produces my glasses, my pants, and my underwear. <laughs> no sign of bear, he says. Giggles start around the table, followed by the roar of uncontrolled laughter. Then every single person falls silent as Catholic man rises from the table. We watch him walk over to my brother to, to accept his trousers, his striped shirt, and his tidy whities still damp with the morning dew. <laughs> he disappears to dress and wash. When he is once again among us, he wears his uniform and looks almost the same as he did when he arrived. He tries to charm my mother one last time with his thanks, his humor, and good manners. But now his collar is rumpled and dirt stains the knees of his blue pants. My mother's smile lacks a degree of warmth as she waves goodbye in the driveway. She will never think of him the same way. And although she says nothing, I know it's not because of the bear. Thank you. Woo! Betsy Morrow, ladies and gentlemen. Betsy Morrow.